just having a few technical problems. Uh, having a few technical problems here with showing the screen. Sorry about this. Try again. should come through there we go right i think this should be good now disease search citizen science welcome to Is the that okay now conservation disease search presentation my name is kevin mcelwee and i'm the chairman of jersey marine but i can hear the voice of the teacher Former. Sorry, what did you say? Uh, I'm hearing some voices from your side, but the presentation is not visible yet. Okay, let's try again. Can you see my screen now, the PowerPoint? No, sir, it is not visible now. Hello, sir. Sir, Hello. we have uh, we have time, sir. Uh, we will wait. No, no hurry, sir. Okay, I did I did upload my presentation to you. Do you have a copy of it? Yes, sir. Uh, hold on a minute. I will uh, contact Vishnu and uh, uh, ask yes, him. Yes, Kevin, okay? we have that copy. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, we will share that soon. A request to the side of audience that uh, please switch off your microphone and video throughout this session and stay here. Wish you all a very good session ahead and make use of it all. Thank you all. I'm going to just try again. How is that now? Is that, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's perfect. perfect. Right. right. I'm going to start. It's accessible now. I'm going to start now. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so okay, much. Sir. Sea search and citizen science. Welcome to the Jersey Marine Conservation Sea Search presentation, the ECOR International Conference 2021. My name is Kevin McElwee, and I'm the chairman of Jersey Marine Conservation. I'm a retired teacher and former professional association of diving instructors and master scuba diving instructor. I'm a member of our Islands Ramp Management Authority and the Jersey National Park Board of Directors. I'm a sea search coordinator and course trainer. Currently, I'm completing an MSc with the Jersey International Center of Advanced Studies, or JICAS for short. Well, here we can see that Jersey and India are actually quite a long way. In fact, we're 8,730 kilometers apart and there is a time difference of five hours. For me, it's mid-morning, but I know it's afternoon for you. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Between England and India, it's actually a 20-hour flight over Europe and the Middle East, crossing the Black and Caspian Seas, but no oceans. Despite the impression that both countries have considerable land masses, the marine environment has an important influence for both nations. Interestingly, both Britain and India have extensive coastlines. The surrounding seas to both nations are extremely important from an ecological and economic perspective. MC, Jersey Marine Conservation, is based on the island of Jersey in the Channel Islands. And you can see on the map the actual Channel Islands extending inside the red Draw a circle 
and of course the island of Jersey. Although very British, we lie very close to France, and we're on about the same latitude as Paris. For a small island, we have a rich history that dates from Paleolithic times to the present day, when much of the economy stems from the finance industry. In the 15th century, fishermen from Jersey crossed the Atlantic annually to catch cod, even at a time when much of America was unexplored. Many early settlers came from the state of New Jersey takes its name from the island. In order to set up a data gathering project, we need to have clear goal. On May the 6th, to prevent French fishing boats from fishing in Jersey's waters. The UK sent two naval vessels to Jersey in post-Brexit fishing rows with France. Boris Johnson dispatched two patrol vessels to protect the island from a feared blockade that included threats to turn off the electricity supply. These are very heavy-handed tactics to illustrate what can happen when data has not been used to set up legislation and laws that can safeguard a country's marine resources. So, what sort of things can our citizen scientists do? Well, I'm using marine examples, but I'm sure you could develop terrestrial activities in a similar way. So let's use seagrass as a citizen science community engagement project example. Seagrasses are indicator species of environmental issues because they respond rapidly to environmental change. They provide insights into overfishing, destructive fishing practices, pollution, and water quality, and much more. Internationally, seagrass is in decline, affected by global warming diseases. Seagrass meadows support a wide range of biodiversity, as you can see from the illustration, including endemic and endangered species. They're also one of the largest blue carbon stocks on Earth, being capable of capturing up to 83 billion metric tons of carbon each year, the equivalent to the carbon emitted by approximately 61 million passenger cars in a year. Seagrass meadows play a vital role in mitigating climate change and stabilizing the carbon cycle. The United Nations Paris Agreement of 2015 set out proposals to protect seagrass. As a consequence, the IUCN created a seagrass specialist group, SSG, led by regional scientists who then led citizen science seagrass monitoring groups. The data they collect contributes to and encourages seagrass research and conservation, with the goal of protecting seagrass species biodiversity worldwide and preserving the functions and values of seagrass habitats, including its role in protecting threatened and endangered species that depend on seagrass for their survival. Seagrass has declined in the UK by 90%, but in Jersey it's actually improving. So it could be a more resilient member of the species. Volunteers, if properly trained, can monitor threatened seagrass meadows and measure changes to its biodiversity. On this slide, we can see one of our team, Sam Blumpy, currently completing a PhD. Here, she is identifying, collecting and measuring samples. She's particularly looking for signs of habitat destruction that have affected species of commercial importance. Surveys need to be comparative. By recording species both inside and outside these areas, we can quantify the impacts caused by mobile fishing gear, aquaculture, overpotting, anchoring, pollution from agricultural runoff, 
such as nitrates, etc. Not diving can be a way citizen scientists can collect data. There is now a lot of modern but affordable technology, such as the remote operated vehicles, like our robot underwater camera, or the baited underwater remote video that you can see being deployed. And finally in the pictures, our towed video camera. Drones can also be used to map seabeds and monitoring fishing practices, identify and measure problems resulting from human presence without even getting wet. Here in this photograph, we can see video from our drone that illustrates the damage being caused by anchoring within our harbour areas. And this area, which should be all seagrass, has been severely reduced by the mooring chains, which are not only destroying the seagrass, but also disturbing the carbon that is stored below the grass in the sand. So as you can see, quite a considerable area has actually been removed and is no longer doing the job that it could be doing as a seagrass meadow. A government project in Jersey that should have used us to survey potential damage was the recent laying of the new electricity supply cable, bringing power to the island from France. No surveys were carried out. The cable was laid through the seagrass beds. Independent surveys by us since the cable has been laid have shown that all along the cable, the cover of seabed speed has been slow. Our low species counts and records of the arrival of the highly destructive slippery limpet shows that disturbances like this makes the area very vulnerable to invasive species that radically alter the biodiversity. India has extensive seagrass beds along the mainland coast and around islands that rely heavily on tourism to boost the economy. Thangaraju and Bat published a paper in 2018 titled Status of Seagrass Systems in India. They tell us that you have 16 species of seagrass with an approximate coverage of 500 square kilometers of isolated locations along the coast, lagoons, black backwaters and estuaries. Principal Zostra areas are the Gulf of Manar, Park Bay, Andaman and Nicobar, Lakshadweep Island and the Gulf of Koch. These areas are home to about 1,250 species of flora and fauna, including endangered dugong and the green turtle that's shown in this photograph. And these species live and breed in a fragile ecosystem. Thangaradan and bat identified that areas could support more seagrass species. This could make a considerable contribution towards carbon sequestration and would be of economic value in the reduction of carbon dioxide. Returning to Jersey, probably Jersey Marine Conservation's biggest contribution to marine conservation came from our citizen science diving surveys to map key benthic habitats, known as merl. Merl is a calcified type of seaweed. And as you can see from the photograph, it looks a bit like popcorn, but is purpley pink in color. It's actually a honeycomb of minute passages and caves. Our data has played a key role in identifying the nursery areas of species important to the commercial fishing industry, such as the scallop that's illustrated in the 
the top right hand corner. The biggest threat to these areas is the practice of dredging. As you can see from the picture, the use of mobile gear is very destructive, changing the biodiversity of massive areas of the seabed. Obtaining scallop by diving is far more sustainable. Mobile gear has particularly affected the distribution and density of temperate water corals, known as pink sea fans. In the UK, they are legally protected, but in Jersey, we're still awaiting the new wildlife law that will offer these species sanctuary. They play a key role in maintaining sea oxygen levels and filtering minerals. They should form extensive forests, but only grow to medium height due to potting roads fouling on them. They are home to nudibranch, false cowries, and the pink sea fan. Another area of concern is the changes that are coming through the migration of species that is being caused by climate change. In the top left hand corner and the right hand side, we have an anemone known as the snake lops anemone. And this arrived in Jersey about 15 years ago. And in the last five years has reached England. Sunset coral in the bottom left is very much a Mediterranean and warm water species. Lump suckers that need cool water to breed have now almost disappeared from our waters. So our citizen science pro project is also giving strong indicators of the effects of climate change. We also are interested in invasive species. Here we have the Asian shore crab, which is threatening our own crab communities. And on the right hand side, an invasive sea squirt known as the leather sea squirt. Looking at invasive species that potentially will affect the reefs of India, lionfish have created worldwide problems that are associated with the release of aquarium specimens. In the Pacific, they coexist with other fish that predate on them. As a result, colonies have not been able to expand and dominate in the areas of their origin. In contrast, in areas such as the Red Sea, east coast of the United States and the Caribbean, lionfish have no predators. Coral reefs already under threat due to bleaching lose up to 80% of their biodiversity as these rapidly breeding fish focus on carnivorous reef dwellers. Damselfish and wrasse that feed on the algae of corals become the next target. As a result, the corals become stifled. The only remedial process is ongoing removal. Doing this commercial expensive, but can be carried out economically by volunteers. We have a huge quantity of plastic waste in our waters, particularly as a result of commercial fishing. And while surveying, we collect as much of it as we can. We record what we find and submit the information to the Marine Conservation Society Plastic Ocean Pollution Database. Let's take a quick look at how the Sea Search project actually works. Well, it's a partnership led by the UK Marine Conservation Society and involves a range of other organisations, including NGOs, regional centres and, of course, sporting bodies. We have a national coordinator to ensure consistency in standards. We have a network of regional coordinators all around the British Isles and Ireland, plus a group in the Maldives as well. We provide training through our tutor system. We run about 40 courses a year at different levels, including entry level observers course, the advanced level, which is more for people with a background in marine biology, and our specialist ID and techniques course. 
We produce well-respected guides on marine life. We also have an online group that will aid people with identification and help them improve their recording skills. We give out qualifications to recognize and encourage quality of recording. Here's one of our forms. This is for Pink Sea fans. It's one that I'm using currently in the study that I'm carrying out. Here's our basic observers reporting form. And I'm just going to go through some key aspects of that. Well, first of all, it's very important that we note down when the actual survey took place. Important aspects such as the sea temperature and the depth, location, an outline sketch of the area, the main things that we saw on there, any evidence of human impacts, the general habitats, and then a very basic list of the species that were seen and the frequency that they were actually encountered in. Let's take a look at a typical survey. Heading to uncharted waters, six days at sea for a group of experts analyzing Jersey marine life. Nothing new about that, you might think, but they've been visiting areas that haven't been formally investigated before. Things that particularly interest us are those species that are that we only see in the Channel Islands and we don't see on the, the north side of the channel. Um, things like the torpedo rays. We see very few undulate rays and we've seen quite a few here. Visibility near Rone and the Paternosters help divers record their data clearly. Local fishermen will be pleased that plenty of undulate ray were spotted. They've long claimed there's a healthy stock of them. But UK regulations mean there's a strict limit on how many they can catch. This study could help change that. As well as finding fish, the team are particularly interested in patterns. That's because climate change is leading to certain species moving from Channel Island to UK waters. Examples include the black-faced blenny and anemone prawn. The next part of the process is looking at the data we've obtained making sure that we have actually accurately recorded what we've seen. We've got a huge number of photographs which we've taken as well, which will probably reveal a lot of species that we actually didn't think we'd seen at the time. The findings will be recorded on a local and national database, but the analysis doesn't stop there. The team will continue to study what's happening in our local waters over the years ahead to determine new and developing trends. Let's now consider the key aspects of how we run our Sea Search Citizen Science project. Firstly, we have to consider why people want to dive and get involved. Do they care about conservation? Divers and recreational water users don't really understand what the problems are. We need to build confidence that they can make a valuable contribution, even with limited knowledge. Ensuring they do not place themselves in dangerous situations is an important consideration and we need to encourage them to build on their knowledge. We need to provide them with a method simple to follow, memorable and fun. We need to promote continuity and reward contributions. Educating the community is a key aspect of our project. We believe that young people are the ambassadors of our future. We have a small team that visits schools. This roadshow is sponsored by Butterfield Bank. Their funding covers the cost of the equipment, the teaching team. We can involve a whole school in the experience. Setting up the challenge and safeguarding the creatures can be challenging, but the response from the students is overwhelming. This coming week, We'll be working with primary schools as part of the environmental and world oceans celebrations. The pupils will investigate the intertidal areas and learn about basic survey methods. I hope that in this talk, I've demonstrated that citizen science can make a huge difference if managed properly. Our current marine protected areas owe their establishment to the data we have collected. 
The hope now is to protect as much of our territorial waters as we can. Currently, we're monitoring a newly created marine protected area, which lies off our south southwest coast. We're also mapping temperate coral locations, and we're hoping to re-establish seagrass meadows, which will form part of a greatly expanded East Ramsar area. Being nominated for awards can help secure funding and encourage support. We've won numerous awards, including the British National Biodiversity Award for Marine Data in 2020. People like to be part of the success story. In 2020, we also formed a partnership with the Jersey Independent College of Advanced Studies and are now helped by MSc students who are engaged in priority investigation producing reports in cooperation with our citizen science volunteers. I hope that I've inspired you today to think about how you can set up projects that will help safeguard the wonderful coastal I would like to thank you for allowing me to be part of this amazing conference. I would also like to thank you for being such a good audience. I hope that I've inspired you in our citizen science project. I look forward to hearing about all the amazing things that you'll be doing in the future. I hope you have a good day and I wish you every success in your projects. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin, sir. So uh, sorry for the inconvenience due to network issues and the technical issues. So it was a really an awesome, informative, and an exciting session for all of us. I wholeheartedly thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, sir. So because of time constraint, let's move on to our next session. Uh, so now let's move to the next session. The posters of the prize winners will be displayed uh, will be displayed on the screen right now. Uh, sorry for the trouble, uh, we couldn't display it earlier. So here are the best posters from the non-scientific poster presentation categories. Just few minutes, we'll display it soon. Yeah, so these are the best posters. The third position is for the poster by Shaika Ashraf, Seri Kashmir University of, of Agricultural Sciences and Technology from Kashmir. Congrats, Shaika. And the second position is secured by Krishna Manish, Kanur University. Congrats, Krishna. The first position is awarded for the poster by Nikhil Rawat from Kumeon University. City. Congrats, Nikhil. So congratulations to all the winners. Thank you. Next, we will move on to scientific post presentation. So dear participants, you have allotted 10 minutes of presentation time and 5 minutes of discussion. So all, please try to complete on time and we request to share your screen by your own self and don't stop sharing until the discussion is over. So all the very best to all for your presentation. Yeah, so thank you, Neetu. Coming to the scientific poster presentation category, starting with the first candidate, we have Miss Akshaya Sundar. She'll be joining us on screen. Over to you, Akshaya. You can now share your screen and start the presentation. Hello. Yes, actually, yes, you're audible. Yeah, this is yeah, okay. Thank you. 
Okay, fine. Uh, warm good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to take you on the voyage of this story about our global ocean. Our life depends on ocean, whereas their life depends on our decision towards them. Ocean is not something that is very distinct or apart from us. A big thumbs up to United Nations for formulating a specialized rescue package for the marine creatures in the form of SDG 14, that is life below water. Today, I'm mainly going to focus on two things that are what are they, like the threats affecting the marine ecosystem and, and what we are going to do with them. That is my recommendation graph. You can very well see that global marine fisheries production is almost around 84 million tons, whereas the global aquaculture production, it is around 51 million tons and the global marine aquaculture production, it is around 31 million tons. So, so on the whole, aquaculture production is on the hike. So people will actually think that aquaculture alleviates the pressure from the oil stock, but that's not the case in reality. One should also know that aquaculture is a feed-based sector, and most of the ingredients used in aquaculture primarily comprises of fish meal and fish oil. Certain estimates say that out of 16 billion forage fishes, we can only produce 8 million fish meal and fish oil. So at the end of 2050, our population will also be around 10 billion. So at that time, it's our responsibility to feed each and everyone with a nutritious diet and to ensure food safety, security, and sustainability. So as an aquaculturist and nutritionist, I have certain suggestions. We need to move towards more novel and sustainable aquaculture technologies like INTA, mariculture, aquaponics, etc. Mariculture in the sense you can culture the bivalves in the rope in the open seas. And INTA is actually integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Let me make it simple for you. INTA is actually a small self-contained environment. And here we are culturing the species at three different trophic levels. The first thing will be the primary producer, which is actually a seaweed. And then we will be culturing a filter feeder like mussels. And then the consumer like the fish of your interest. So the best part about this is here the primary producer and the filter feeder will remove the nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the water. And they will transfer them into their bio. So it's an additional source of income as well as you can manage the system sustainably. And also CMFRA in India has already taken this initiative and it's successful in Tamil Nadu and Kerala as well. Then I'm going to talk about the major research thing because uh, nowadays most of the research in this area and the challenging one is the finding a novel fish feed ingredient that could at least reduce the pressure on fish meal and fish oil. So people say that insect meal like black soldier fly larvae, microalgae, macroalgae are the one that could at least reduce the pressure on this. But the problem here is the mass production. We need to look into that. And then in this graph, you can very well see that I have displayed stresses in four different categories. First, I'm going to talk about the overfishing. For example, if you take the trawl, which is actually a non-selective and a destructive gear as well. So what happens here is trawl fishing actually extends below 2,200 meters across all oceans and affects nearly 15 million square kilometer of seafloor every year. And United Nations, if it was even estimated that two thirds of the fish stocks has been exploited to the maximum of MSY. MSY in the sense maximum sustainable yield whereas one third has been beyond MSY. Okay, let me make it simpler for you. For example, if you take the uh, large fishes like tuna or swag fishes, almost 90% of their population has been already gone. So what is fueling this overfishing is even more cruel. That is IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. I don't know how many of you know that yesterday was the international day to fight against IUU fishing. This is actually where we are. We have very less awareness when it comes to marine ecosystem. And also people have many misconceptions towards marine creatures as well. So this IEU fishing is nearly contributing around 20% of the catch. And the World Bank has even estimated that 
on an year average 235 billion us dollar loss is happening what you are going to do you may think, yes as a human what i can do for a bit yes you can you need to move towards the seasonal stock and then you need to follow a proper certification and traceability like whether the seafood or fish which you are consuming is whether from a sustainable source or not it is the only way to fight against overfishing as well and then we need to have a proper bycatch reduction devices and also we need to uh, move towards the square mesh instead of diamond mesh then i'm going to talk about the land based so whenever i talk about the pollution people will definitely think that oil spill is the one and only reason but that's not only the reason i can say you that 80 percentage of the pollution is mainly from the land based source so one of the most underrated and the crucial one is the nutrient pollution you can see in the news that people will be clicking selfies and suddenly because of water has changed their color to blue green etc etc i think that it's an actual miracle but that's the case Really a toxic algae like the blue green algae and all things. And once they die, they even sink to the ocean and create a zone. One such bad example is what is happening in Baltic Sea. It is one of the largest brackish water area in the world. And research say there is twenty fold increase in oxygen dead zones. And the worst example for overfishing could be the collapse of tuna that is mainly bluefin tuna in Mediterranean Sea. so then the climate crisis which is the onslaught unseen in human history i have three things here the first thing is warming then acidifying and then the loss of oxygen i call these three as the deadly trio because what happens here is actually the ocean surfaces it getting heated because ocean is the major source of co2 sequestration and because of that there is a drop in ph and ocean acidification and after that bleaching of corals because of that uh, fishes dependent on those areas affected and finally our fishes are affected so it's like a chain process right and can you believe me traffic could also one of the reason for nutrient pollution yes you heard me right burning of gasoline actually releases a compound named nitrogen oxide which acts as the source of nitrogen once they rain so the major thing i can give you for an example to climate change is two weeks before i think each and every one of us will be knowing this world largest iceberg breaks off in antarctica can you imagine how big it is it is actually three times bigger than our capital delhi and then sea level rise people think it's just a small value it's not a big deal but that's not the case on an average 3.3 mm rise in sea level if this situation continues in future then 36 million indians will become homeless and they will lose their livelihood and shipping so you must know that marine mammals they communicate within their communities by means of signal and because of this shipping which is a source of noise pollution they are creating a miscommunication and also whenever such accidents happen in middle ocean we there is a chances that release of toxic chemicals and oil spill getting enter our magnanimous environment and finally i'm going to talk about the plastic soup yeah you heard me right everyone likes to have a seafood soup but i don't think plastic soup sounds good right yes but what happens here is even in mariana trench people have recorded that the traces of plastics are found guys please remember that you are what you eat let me give you a story for that actually what happened is kerala fish of folks what they are doing is along with catching the fishes they are taking back the plastic and bringing them back to the shore where they are shredding them recycling them and adding them to the roads to make them stronger so they are doing their bit it's not just the ngos or government or fish of folk each and every one of us holds some responsibility in this because each and every one of us breathe the oxygen from the ocean right so i'm leaving such things to you covid is today's issue but what i'm concerned is actually tomorrow's issues i think it's time high time to press the pass button hard and one should know to draw the line i can very well say that no one will let our own home to turn into a garbage patch 
then why are we doing this to ocean? So I would like to summarize this by saying that sustainability should no longer remain a lip service. And this SDG 14 is a win to win proposition to all other SDGs as well. Mask yourself, guys, but don't mask the ocean. From having the right attitude to action, protection with conservation, and remember, sustainability is for our survival. I'm ready for change. Are you? Stay safe, but not at the expense of nature. No one is, remember, guys, no one is safe unless our nature is safe. We have one ocean, one planet, and a one and only life to save and restore them. It's time for restoration. And stay awesome, stay productive, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patient listening. Yeah, thank you, Akshaya. I will now request Kevin, sir, to share his views on Akshaya's presentation. So please. Thank you. Well, well done, Akshaya. That was an excellent presentation. And I really enjoyed the way that you address the problem and uh, I, I would say that um, from a, a standard that was certainly very very high indeed so well done I just have two questions for you Achaya if I may yeah. um, yes sir yes sir thank you um, my first one is regarding mm. uh, you, you know you were talking about aquaculture and mm. um, we are finding certainly in the UK that one of the, the big problems with aquaculture mm. is the huge number of fish that um, are not surviving and one of the problems of course is that if you actually feed fish you do change their behavior um, attitudes um, which causes a problem if you try and release them back into the the normal environment did you have any thoughts about that Actually, sea ranching program and everything is on actually a pilot scale level. It's not well standardized. Actually, the thing is, uh, we need to have the people were mainly focusing on the replacement and they're trying out different feeds and the different practices. But the, the problem here is, firstly, they were successful when it's done in a pilot scale. But when it's getting into a huge dynamic environment, again, a problem. So that I say that intense research has to be carried out in a natural environment. And after that, only we can standardize or commercialize anything. It's my opinion. Thank you, Achaya. And then just one other uh, question, which I know is very, very controversial. Mm. But do you think that actually the biggest problem we have is population expansion? Because, yes, we can potentially generate more food sources. But mm. the problem we've got is can we keep pace with population expansion? Do you have any thoughts about Actually, that? Actually, the thing is like population expansion is not, I won't say that it is the major problem. The major problem here is the malnutrition. Even now, when you take that at the end of 2020, when compared to 2050, population is not that high, but still there are many dying out of malnutrition. So the first thing we need to focus is the malnutrition. And it can only be uh, carried out successfully when we have such nutritious product like the fish and the other seafood. So the problem here is anyhow, we are going to increase the production. And at the same time, we have to take care of the environment as well. So it's actually a very tough situation. And it's going, I think the biggest challenge is not the population, how we are going to increase the production at the same time, how we are going to maintain the sustainability. That will be the major problem. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable comments. Thank you, Akshaya. It was a good presentation. Next, we have with us our second presenter, Charles Po. Charles, you can now share the screen and start your presentation. Yes, um, just give me a moment. Yeah, sure. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, I'll do this. 
Yeah, it is visible. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Charles Ko, and I'm an MSc student. So, the presentation which I'm putting forward to you is just based on some research papers which I referred and some thoughts which we can uh, think about uh, or uh, help in a conversation uh, conservation. Uh, so, this is the abstract. So, as you all know, that plastic is a necessary evil for everyone because we use it in our day-to-day -day life for many of our uh, activities and uh, it has been uh, causing a lot of destruction all around the world and it's been increasing day by day because of the constant use of plastic. So now the thing is, the main focus of mine would be on microplastics which are being formed due to a lot of exposure in the ocean, oceanic environment and uh, due to the UV lights and the constant uh, wave movement, there have been a uh, breakage of those big plastics into smaller chunks, which are microplastics. So this in turn is affecting a lot of marine life and uh, also uh, affecting their uh, growth and reproduction. Uh, similarly, uh, the other problems are oil spills, which have been occurring also. Um, so this has also been affecting many uh, organisms like the algae, the phytoplankton, uh, by um, providing, uh, by uh, acting as a shield against the sunlight. So they, they, the autotrophic organisms, they cannot prepare their food. So, so the, this is one of the papers which I referred. Uh, so in this case, uh, so you have your oil, which, ha which uh, by the use of this person uh, is broken down into smaller chunks and uh, these smaller chunks are acted on by microbes uh, so that it can easily be degradable. So uh, some of the organisms here I mentioned are Pseudomonas, Ceruginosa and Bacillus subtilis. So uh, this is a very effective technique but it is also very difficult to be done. Um, so uh, yeah. Okay, and this thing, uh, this slide is focused mainly on degradation of microplastics. So here you have uh, plastic being uh, for, uh, forming three major uh, debris or three major products, which is one is like a cross-linking residue, uh, the other is microplastic and small debris. So cross-linking would be an another structure formation which is happening with a lot of plastic. So it formulates and forms a new structure altogether because of the constant mixing of the of the molecules. And uh, so you can, uh, so usage of the microorganisms have been very beneficial, and uh, you can easily get non-toxic products, and which can be released into the ocean. So firstly, you'll have to do a lot of pre-treatment required, which is not very easy. It is difficult, but it can be done if uh, you have the proper facilities, etc. So, so these are some organisms I've mentioned. So polyethylene is one of the major microplastics which has been which has been causing a lot of uh, uh, destruction in the oceans. It has been affecting many uh, marine life, fishes, uh, uh, other organisms, corals. So it has been affecting their functioning. And the other one is polycaprolactone. So this is a biodegradable plastic, but it takes a, around one year to degrade. So the organisms I mentioned here are Pseudomonas fluorescent, um, Pseudomonas chlorophyll, Chlororapsis, uh, then for polycaprolactone is Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium acetobutylicum. So finally, this is like the main slide which I will focus on. So what can we do about it? So the thing is, we we we'll first firstly, it's a common thing that we'll have to start with our reduction of the waste of plastic, which we have been using, and switch to some better alternatives such as bioplastic, um, and also. Uh, now, to treat base all plastics, we'll have to use uh, some amount of microorganisms also. But we'll have to use microorganisms which can, can uh, you know, uh, survive in those harsh conditions in the ocean. And uh, so the pre-treating thing, which I was thinking of, so I'm not so sure if this idea has been told in the past, but I just thought about it. So I was thinking, like, why don't uh, we, you know, uh, convert those microplastics uh, by some... Uh, chemical treatment into some smaller um, smaller byproduct 
uh, which 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 is still not uh, which still may be a toxic product, but it may be easy for uh, microorganisms to literally break break it down into smaller chunks and produce non-toxic products because it takes a lot of time for microorganisms to literally break down the microplastic. And uh, so I was just thinking of this. So uh, as I have listed today in this table, so we have your oil or your microplastic. So doing a chemical treatment. And then uh, those byproducts, you're subjecting them to microbial degradation. And finally, you're producing non-toxic product, which can help save life and not affect any of the marine organisms. So finally, uh, also we should switch to some um, uh, some better alternatives when it comes to microplastics. There have been a lot of uh, microbean um, uh, toothpaste or uh, 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 cosmetic industry uses them for whitening purposes. So instead of that, we, we can use some better better alternatives, uh, cellulose, uh, uh, beef. Uh, uh, so those are easy. Those are kind of easy to degrade, and also they they don't affect the marine life like the plastics do. And finally, we are at a higher risk of uh, microplastic consumption because finally through the food chain that we acquire a lot of this plastic. So we need to do something about it. So this was one. Um, Thought which I had and I just wanted to put forth. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. So would you like to give any comments? Thank you. Uh, yes, hello, Charles. Well done with hello, your presentation. Hello. Uh, well done with your presentation. That was really very, very interesting. And you know, thank you for I, was, I was fascinated by uh, some of the processes that you were actually considering. Um, one question I have for you, actually, is yes, the economic side of this. I mean, you know, for example, where I live in Jersey, uh, we would very, very much like to have better recycling processes. But of course, the big issue is that the cost of this equipment is incredibly expensive. Have you given any consideration to the companies that are creating the problems actually contributing towards these expensive processes? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, so when it comes to um, companies, uh, like uh, they need those products, right? Which are, suppose when you consider the cosmetic industry and all, they need those uh, kind of plastics because, because of uh, what they offer, like, uh, um, now the microbes which are used, they help in whitening processes. But then uh, it's a very cheap alternative. That's why they use it. But then if we can come up with something which can you know help uh, help them in some way, and also simultaneously reducing the use of microbes which are very toxic and they are ending up in the oceans constantly, and there are trillions of those particles. So we can come up with some alternative like that. But it is and it is very costly, of course. But but I'm sure we can come up with something efficient and which can help save uh, the ocean. Thank you, Charles. Do you think, though, that you know when you talk about providing a solution um, in a similar way to the strategies for dealing with climate change, we should perhaps put time uh, constraints on those developments? Um. So, like um, when it, now when it comes to um, formation of processes, they can take a lot of time. So um, th there has to be a step by step protocol being done for all uh, methodologies if we are planning to carry out. It cannot happen very quickly, so it needs a lot of processing. I see. I do agree with you to an extent, Charles, but then. We have yes. a very interesting analogy, don't we? In that, yes. you know, <laughs> this terrible problem at the moment with the COVID virus. And yes. it's been an interesting um, development in that because there has been a pressing need for a solution, we have rapidly found one. And although we're told that climate change, if it's not remedied quickly, will become economically and environmentally far worse we are still yes, not really addressing the problem in the same way yes sir yes sir. i completely agree that we 
uh but i think uh with a lot of brilliant minds you know having a lot of different of these ideas we can have some changes being done by a lot of youngsters which have so many different ideas and uh, putting all those together i think we can come up with better solutions for this problem in the future thank you charles well done thank you sir thank you sir yeah thank you kevin sir thank you charles it was a great presentation indeed now we have our final presenter for the day miss uh, shashi meri priya with her presentation you can now start your presentation priya yes Please, uh, please wait. Uh... Yeah, take your time. Okay. Did you get my screen? Hello. Hello. Yeah, it is not visible yet. Oh, really? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Now it's visible. You can continue. Okay. Uh, I'm Sashi Meri Priya from Bardasan University. Uh, my poster presentation uh, entitled is uh, "Remote Sensing and GA Simulation of Inundation Risk in uh, Coastal Region of Kerala, Tamil Nadu." Uh, now I'm coming to the introduction. Sea level rise significantly related with global warming, according to the uh, IPCC. Uh, during 28th century an annual average global sea level rose by uh, 1.7 mm per year from 1987 to 2010 sea level mainly affected um, uh, sea level uh, mainly affected uh, 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 the low lying region uh, also caused several uh, physical impacts that is coastal erosion inundation coastal storm flooding and uh, land displacement uh, there are uh, more than 26% of people lives uh, near the coastal region so increasing population are exposed to natural hazards such as uh, storms tsunami and uh, shoreline changes bay of bengal region is considered the cyclone prone region it is experienced more uh, 20 more than uh, 26 uh, 26 uh, cyclone crossed over this region for the past 10 years this study identifies coastal uh, coastal areas that are at uh, rise of flooding under extreme conditions also the risk map uh, provide initial and precautionary guide for uh, coastal planning and management this study which uh, coastal planning and management this study it is identifies uh, the impact of um, uh, hazards on uh, coastal communities uh, reason for choosing my study is uh, the kadalu region experienced uh, the worst impact to the tsunami surge uh, and inundation the surge height uh, recorded around 2.2 uh, to uh, 5 meter during uh, tsunami and runoff ranged from 2.5 to uh, 3 meter with inundation distance between 300 to uh, 1600 meter during uh, tsunami uh, also the cyclone uh, river uh, never hit on this region in 2020 it destroyed uh, around uh, 2900 acres of uh, crops land and uh, more than uh, 18 people were died uh, uh, more than uh, 50 52000 people were accommodated in uh, relief stations so uh, so i have chosen this uh, Uh, region uh, chosen this region also this region uh, faced uh, several damage due to storm surges and floods so uh, uh, so uh, 
uh, it creates uh, critical uh, management during uh, risk situation uh, now i am coming to the uh, Study area. This region, uh, this region, situated at Bay of Bengal region. It is a low-lying region and with a gentle slope, resulting in large inundation and therefore increased vulnerable of of the region. Uh, and then uh, the coastal towns of Kadalu is most down, uh, most densely populated region. Uh, Shoreline changes assessment was made for. Uh, entire Kadalu region. The geomorphology of the Kadalu coastal stretch indicates uh, the coastal plain, uh, rice to beaches, sand dunes, mangrove uh, swamps. Now I am coming to the meteorology part. Uh, the study meteorology is described under the four major head 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 headings. One is um, uh, one is coastal inundation. Uh, second one is coastal uh, show, uh, coastal erosion. Uh, second uh, third one is land use affected by inundation. People uh, fourth one is people affected by inundation. Uh, first uh, first I have prepared a slope map for the uh, year of 2016 using with digital elevation data with the previous study. Uh, 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 this map uh, in order to evaluate the vulnerability of the slope compared with the previous study and that is slope is uh, greater than 1.9 it indicates the low vulnerable region but if the slope is uh, less than 0 0.6 uh, uh, it, it is ranked as very high vulnerable region then I have prepared inundation map for two, uh, two, water, uh, two water level one is uh, 1.5 meter and the second one is uh, 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 three uh, three meter for inundation map uh, point and vector data were used steady boundary were extracted from them data then I have prepared contours with 2.5 meter interval then uh, then I have uh, then I have derived uh, inundation zone from uh, two different values one is 0 0.5 meter and two, uh, 3 point uh, 3 meter for sea level rise scenario inundated area were identified by overlaying the inundation zone with the land use map I, I used the Landsat images for shoreline changes, um, uh, changes, uh, 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 change, uh, changes uh, for different years was identified using DSAS. I used a endpoint ratio, which is the output of DSAS. Uh, the erosion accretion spread are indicate of very high vulnerable due to very high vulnerable to uh, very low vulnerable. Now I am coming to the result section. And uh, uh, this picture indicates uh, this picture indicates the coast uh, coast with low uh, low relief as uh, imparted by lesser coastal slope or uh, of high vulnerable to the result of uh, coastal region of Kadalur is high vulnerable rating as the coastal slope is less than 1.0.6. Now I am coming to the figure four. Uh, uh, this picture is a flood inundation map of two different water level uh, that is uh, that is uh, indicated a high vulnerable to sea level rise and the inundation distance of uh, 0 0.6 kilometer is formed in uh, one one card uh, and in pichavaram uh, pichavaram for one point uh, 1.5 meter sea level at the same time uh, the uh, 3 meter uh, uh, 3 meter sea level projection gives that the entire uh, uh, coastal region comes under the very higher vulnerable category uh, now i am coming to the uh, figure 5 uh, it is illustrated the shoreline erosion Uh, shoreline erosion and accretion map from 1995 to uh, 2021. The Kadalur uh, total shoreline length is uh, 117 kilometer. This picture shows the uh, northern part. Uh, northern uh, northern part is highly vulnerable due to uh, uh, coastal erosion. That is uh, minus at the, at the rate of minus 4.23 uh, 
meter per the past 25 years but at the same time uh, 80% of uh, sure uh, sure uh, sure was accreted it can be classified as accreting coast uh, remaining sure was uh, remaining sure that is 25% of uh, sure was stable it showing uh, no marked changes of the coast because uh, the shoreline production structures that is uh, sea walls and the rip crack adjacent to the coastal uh, coast of the kadalu now i am coming to the uh, conclusion and discussion part uh, the table one indicates that uh, that uh, indicates that the land use affected by sea water the blue color uh, the blue color indicates um, 1.5 meter of sea level which is affected by uh, which is affected and uh, and the green uh, uh, green color indicates the three uh, green color indicates uh, the total surface area of coastal uh, the total surface area of coastal uh, is around uh, 1900 and square kilometer hmm. uh, but uh, the one 1.5 meter of kadalur around uh, 1.5 meter of sea water inundation affected around 4.46.86 uh, square kilometer uh, at the same time uh, 3 meter inundation will occupy around uh, uh, 210 square kilometer of land area the figure uh, the figure shows the coastal population uh, uh, population which is going to affect the upcoming sea level in kadal there are uh, nine, uh, 95000 people are settled near the coastal region those people are severely uh, affected uh, will, will affected uh, sea water inundation or some uh, natural calamities uh, now I am coming to the uh, conclusion. Uh, the purpose of this study is to understand the uh, current and the future risk expected from the global warming. This study confirms the previous finding that the coastal structure uh, of Kadalur are in a high risk zone for multi hazards. This results of uh, this uh, this uh, this study uh, presented here suggested that inundation already created critical management challenges along the coastal Kadalur. Such information and the data would assist the local state government in preparing for the impact of erosion, inundation risk, and future sea level rise along the Indian coastline. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Session Mary Priya. The topic is now open for discussion. I would now request Kevin sir to share his views. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, should I call you Rajan or Priya? What is correct? Which one is correct? Priya. Priya. Hello, Priya. Yes, well, sir. thank you very much. <clears throat> that was a very, very interesting presentation. And I particularly enjoyed uh, listening to the way that you'd associated the gradient slopes with the area. Um, I just have a little clarification question, if I may. Um, you showed a diagram on the um, Cuddle region, um, the coastal area around Taluk. Um, I wasn't really able on, that's figure five, the colour coding. Could you just say a little bit more about that colour coding that you used there, please? Yes, sir. Uh, the colour coding is indicates the shore plain erosion accretion and the green color indicates uh, coastal erosion very high erosion uh, that light color green is indicated uh, 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 low uh, erosion and uh, yellow color indicates medium erosion and uh, orange color indicates uh, uh, high accretion and uh, red color indicates very high accretion of this region thank you very much and could you just uh, clarify so in terms of just an approximation, what sort of population would you estimate is affected by this? Um, sorry, uh, can you please tell me? Yeah, uh, I mean, you've got the various, uh, the, in this table one, you've got total populations um, and they're, they're for the different areas. So what actually would you estimate is the total population? Sir, uh, this, uh, this total population I have collected from uh, uh, Kadalur, uh, uh, 
கடலூர் அட்மினிஸ்ட்ரேட்டிவ் ஏரியா திஸ் திஸ் பாப்புலேஷன் ஃபிகர் இண்டிகேட்ஸ் சப்போஸ் த சீ லெவல் ரைஸ் கம்ஸ் அரௌண்ட் த்ரீ மீட்டர் த என்டையர் கோர்ஸ் வில் பி சப்மர்ஸ் சப்மர்ஸ்டு டியூ டு சீ வாட்டர் ஸோ தோஸ் பீப்புள் டெஃபினெட்லி வில் அஃபெக்ட் டியூ டு சீ லெவல் ரைஸ் yeah so so are we talking about 5 million people 10 million people so uh, that is a uh, sir uh, uh, this table shows uh, near to the coastal region not inland so uh, i just collected the uh, coastal village uh, from uh, shore to uh, around 10 km then i have uh, uh, plot this top graph okay okay it just seems to me that potentially uh with such a big region affected it is going to be uh, disastrous if there is a, a, an inundation do you agree yes sir thank you very much indeed well well done and i really enjoyed that presentation thank, thank you thank you sir yeah thank you kevin sir it is great having you here thank you all for your valuable comments and thank you all for the uh, all the participants for your great presentations with that we can end up the poster presentation session thank you all for your patient listening thank you over to you neeto yes uh, like amrita said the scientific poster presentation session is over so thank you again and congratulations to all the presenters who presented your valid investigations and findings here so we will send you the e certificates of selected poster through your mail soon so next we will have with us jishnu eco foundation chief organizer to uh, deliver the official word of thanks hello am i audible hello am i audible Yes, Jishnu, you are audible. Okay. Uh, it will be very warm good. Uh, a very warm good evening, one and all. Myself, Jishnu, founder and director of Eco Foundations. Uh, I feel I feel really proud and pretty much happy in this special occasion since the Eco Foundation is celebrating World Environmental Day and World Ocean Day together with our international conference, Eco Risa. As we all knows that, and even. like this cannot be happen overnight it is require planning and a bad i for details we have uh, we have been plan- uh, we have been fortunate enough to have been backed by a team of very motivated and delicate uh, uh, dedicated organizers so in this joyful occasions i would like to convey my sincere thanks to each and everyone who worked hard to make this event a great success first of all on the behalf of eco foundations and myself i would like to thank the chief organizer of the program mr sandeep and adra jay chandran for the uh, in, for their and must uh, endeavors i must uh, uh, sorry uh, i must uh, extend my deep sense of appreciation for the uh, organizers uh, conveners coordinators and poster designers for their restless works and efforts and also media executives for their support in the ex- in the extensive promotion work moving to the three honorable uh, esteem speakers who played an inevitable part of the con- uh, conference and further we are also grateful to have one of our esteemed person kevin mecca uh, with us he is one of my best friend and mentor and inspired personality uh, inspired personality in my, my life i think we are lucky to have a inspired diver and teacher in a, like him in our platform to share his views and 20 years of diving experience and he is a man of conservation in action rather than conservationist in the such papers in each of our presentation uh, in each of our personal chats uh, we really uh, he was really enthusiastic expressive and sometimes very uh, on the current conservation lackness once again thank you uh, mr kevin for addressing the people who are eager to listen the uh, sea search and uh, love to explore the blue world by a deep dive and it was really and uh, it was really a diving experience with you uh, with you during your lecture thank you so much kevin 
uh, I also wish to express my deepest gratitude to Dr. Dr. Vaibhav Egnath Gosai from the Gbipan Institute of Himalayan Geology, Himalayan Environmental Sustainable Development, and Dr. P. Sandhanam, Associate Professor, Bharatidasan University, for their wonderful sessions and support. And next, I would like to appreciate our uh, cute little and gracious angers of the Ecodesa 2021. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants and all the people who support us uh, throughout this event okay thank you so much all once again and who are gathering here and uh, we will conduct the programs in upcoming um, near soon and we are expecting your participation in it also okay thank you so much uh, for your valuable time and stay safe. thank you one and all thank you jishnu Thank you, Mr. Jishnu. And I have to mention that a special thanks to Mr. Kevin sir for taking your session early due to some technical inconvenience from our side for non-scientific post presentation. So I just want to mention that too, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And for wind up the session, I would like to hand over the mic to Amrita. Please, Amrita. Yeah, thank you, Nitu. So hope that all of you enjoyed our sessions on both the days of Echo Erisa, the, inter, uh, the virtual event. I, on behalf of Echo Foundation, would like to place on record our sincere gratitude to all of you for your presence, efforts, and support to each one of you. It's you who made this magnificent event possible. Thank you, everyone, for your support and encouragement. We'll provide e-certificates soon. Via May. So let's wind up the conference. If have a great day. Thank you.
will see you. But um, this one did not work. As you have, the clock is on crystal. Let me, let me speed you along. 